So we've been trying to understand why is there so much diversity in life, both historically and across space. Just like Darwin tried to understand the patterns of diversity as he traveled around the world, and how he saw those unique adaptations leading to variations, both within species and between species, how animals and organisms in general were unevenly distributed across space and time, and how sometimes similar features showed up in similar environments where animals had to perform different functions. All those specimens, all those fossils, all those drawings that Darwin collected and did actually helped him figure out that this diversity had to be explained somehow. And remember how he explained this. He said, populations increase exponentially over time if left unchecked. The environment, therefore, however, has limited resources, which means population growth is hindered by these limited factors. Then, which means only a fraction of the offspring survive this environmental pressure. Animals, therefore, must struggle to survive and their struggle for their existence against members of the same species and other species. Animals with the best set of adaptations, which we call the fittest, will live longer, reproduce more often, and have more offspring that lives to do the same. And therefore, the process of natural selection will lead to the, over time, to the, to the formation of animals with features that make them more likely to survive. So, over time, features of the fittest animals become more common in the population, leading to changes gradually over time and creating evolution or changes in the population. And since this change is tied to the environment, which changes over places and time, different animals exist in different places or areas of the earth. And these changes can be gradual or sudden. And we call that gradualism or punctuated equilibrium. That is Darwin's theory of evolution. And I hope that you can recite this and understand this. Because if you can, you can actually apply the concept over and over again to explain everything that life does. Now, there's some final things that we have to clarify. First of all, very important, it is populations that evolved, not species. And we learn about this in, in another lecture, lecture series where we talk about population genetics. But it's very important to understand that you cannot evolve. A member of the species, it cannot evolve. You're going to be born the one way and you're going to die the same way. Genetically, you're going to be the same. Changes will only happen in population over time as the genes which are more common are selected for across generations. And so this is going to take a long time in many generations and it's the population that evolves, never an actual specimen of a species. Okay. Also, fitness is not just based on, on survival. It's not a survival of the fittest. It's more like on the adaptations that you have, the greater number of adaptations, which increases your chances to survive, have more offspring, and have offspring that has greater success relative to that of others. And that's what we call the concept of, of Darwinian or relative fitness. So it's not just uh, how good you are at surviving. In other words, look at the dove, for example, how it had many, everything that it is and everything that it does has an explanation. Why it has the neck to the shape that it does. Why it has the toes the way it does. Everything about the dove can be explained either based on what their ancestors were like or based on their current needs of the dove are like. Likewise, different populations will have different amounts of survival rates. Look at humans, for example. We tend to live, uh, lots of us survive our only young life. And then as we get older, less and less of us survive. Look at clams, on the other hand. Very few survive the beginning of their life, but the ones that actually survive live very, very long times. While the, and the squirrels will be all the way in between the range. This is what we call a survivorship curve. Different species have different strategies for survival. Same thing for reproductive rates. Some species tend to reproduce less often, uh, have longer maturation periods, longer gestation periods, take care of their young, and take more time to, care, to select mates, while other species will select mates rest carefully, have more children, have shorter lives, have more uh, reproductive uh, events, where they have many children that they don't take care of. In other words, there are many strategies to try to increase the, le the length of the life, the reproductive mm -hmm. rate, and the success of the offspring in terms of actually living with the package of traits that the person actually has. But when everything is said and done, the concept of fitness has to do with all of it put together. 
the best set of adaptations, which makes you more likely to increase your lifespan, more increase your reproductive rate, or increase the success of your offspring to do the same relative to that of other species. Some people f focus on one aspect of fitness, having more children. Other people focus on making success of the children. Others focus on longer lives. Others focus on more adaptations. But it's the species that put the whole package together that are going to be the ones which are going to survive for a very long, long time. Another important principle or consequence of what we understand as the theory of evolution is that the speciation is the process by which new species come from older species over time. In other words, that new species arise from other species. Or, and that often will happen either because of isolation between the old and new species and then pressurization under different conditions or different environments. And it can still happen within the same kind of environment, but that's less likely to happen. But, and it will still require other kinds of isolation. And we'll talk about that in another chapter where we're going to go over the basics of speciation. And also, what we'll also talk about in another chapter is that the consequence of this is that all organisms descend from other organisms. And therefore, uh, there's this idea of descent with modification, that new life forms are basically based on old life forms with small changes. And that all the features of life forms evolve over time. And that's why there's so much diversity of life. All these diversity of life exists because of different features evolving in different conditions and different species come from uh, forefathers that experience different conditions. And so as you see a life form, you see not longer the current conditions that are favoring that kind of animal to exist, but also the conditions that favor its ancestors to exist. Now, the ultimate implication of this set with modification is that all life on Earth shares common ancestry. Because if you keep reversing this thought back and back into time, you eventually realize that it's just like all animals, uh, basically come, having all mammals come from one original mammal, that probably means that mammals, birds, and reptiles all come from the same thing, which then all comes from the same thing and so forth. And eventually you can go back in time and find the original life form on Earth from which all life forms eventually came. And this is something that we're going to talk about when we talk about the history of life in another chapter. And we're also going to talk about this in taxonomy. But th therefore, I hinted that we're going to be having special chapters to address special aspects of these ideas about evolution. One chapter to, to, to observe the idea of microevolution or evolution in populations, which is what, is what evolves, not species. We call that population genetics. One factor to talk about speciation or how species change over time and descend with modification. Another chapter to talk about the idea that all life comes from original life form and or abiogenesis or the life original life form on earth. And throughout the year, we're going to observe the idea of relative fitness or the idea that forms fix function and that all features of life can be explained through the process of evolution. Uh, and that everything there is comes either because the, it fulfills a purpose on the animal or because it fulfilled a purpose in the animal's ancestors. All right? So that's basically the principles of the idea of evolutionary theory. And this theory has been uh, succeeded to a lot of criticism historically. First of all, strong social op opposition to the theory, the theory has been constant ever since it came out. In the, in the 1800s because mostly of religious dogma which opposes the idea of life not being created or, or, or organized by a major intelligent design. And I'll make no, no point about that except that, that whether or not someone designed the system, clearly this is how life does change. And it's kind of like ignorant to deny this reality. Uh, apart from the origin of life, the change in life is a reality. We actually see it happening. And we'll talk about the evidence in the next video. And it's kind of hard to argue against it. All the evidence that there is for evolution makes us see for sure that evolution is real. Whether or not life started this way, uh, and it's a different story. But life has changed this way ever since it started. And that's a fact. Also, social opposition for this theory has because it has, it has been applied incorrectly to justify things like social Darwinism, which is the idea that among us humans, there's only the strongest who survive. And that's a lot of bad things have happened because of that, including eugenics, uh, all the things that Nazi people did during the World War II, 
uh, genocide, a lot of these things have been justified on the basics of the theory of evolution, but that's a misinterpretation of what Darwin suggested. Likewise, there's been a historical criticism for Darwin because he may have gotten some of his ideas from Alfred Wallace. But to his defense, he did present his ideas by saying that Alfred Wallace contributed to his ideas and mentioning Wallace's letter and essays. He also uh, noticed that throughout his life, he did say that the idea of common ancestry was much influenced by the, by the work of Alfred Wallace. And that Wallace has independently reached the idea of struggle for existence, which is another name for the natural selection process that, that, that Darwin came up with. But either way, the most important criticism, in my opinion, is scientific criticism. Because although Darwin really did explain how new kinds of life forms come through through the process of natural selection, he never provided an explanation for the mechanism that creates variation and how that variation is passed on from generation to generation. So he did not know about genetics. He did not know about mutations and inheritance through genes. And that's the major criticism that has for his theory. But regardless of all of that, Darwin may be considered the forefather for modern biology for his contribution to our understanding of evolution, which explains everything about the characteristics of life and the way that life actually acts, where life comes from, uh, how it changes, and how, why it forms fit function among life forms. All right? On the next video, we're going to be talking about the evidence that substantiates the theory of evolution. I'll see you guys then.